Good morning and welcome to our service of worship for August 16th. It's so good to see you once again. My name is Scott Taylor and we're looking forward to another morning of worship when we gather as the body of Christ, even though we cannot gather in person with each other still. So I wanna encourage you because of that to once again, be intentional to pass the peace to, um, to your brothers and sisters in the church. And, and especially this morning, I want you to think is there someone who you have not spoken with for six months? That's a long time, but that's how long we've been, um, been doing our, our physically distanced worship. And so I encourage you to, to think and just take some time, be quiet and wait for God to place someone on your heart. I also want you to know that in three weeks time from now on September 6th, it's gonna be the Sunday just before Labor Day, we're gonna have a very special service of worship, one service, not traditional, not contemporary. Instead, we're gonna have a service that is led by Whitewater Bluegrass Company. Now, um, Uncle Ted and the members of Whitewater Bluegrass have been a part of our church family, of our extended church family for quite some time now. They've played for uh, music makers events and they always play for our annual pig picking, which we had to cancel earlier this summer. So we encourage you to prepare for what we know is gonna be a very special worship experience on September 6th. You know, today, Pastor Keith is bringing us a sermon that is about fishing and it's about being in the boat. And I'm reminded that whenever we come to church, we come onto God's boat. I'm standing right now in what we call the nave of the church. And the word nave literally means ship. It comes from the Latin word navis, and it's from, it's from which we get the word naval and our navy. You can hear how all those words are connected. And so I'm standing in the nave of the church or the ship of the church, the boat of the church. And we call it this because churches are often designed to look like boats turned upside down. Um, one of the best examples of this is probably Grace Episcopal Church right down the street. Anyway, we use this symbol of a boat to remind us that we are in the boat with God, that we are being ferried through the storm of life in the ark of God. And as Keith is going to remind us this morning, when we take some time and let Jesus into our boat, no matter what that boat looks like, whether it's a grand yacht or a rickety old raft barely staying afloat, when we let Jesus into our boat, amazing things happen. And so I say to you, the body of Christ here, at First Methodist Church of Waynesville, one more time, the Lord be with you. Let us worship God together again. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today is the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. It's Jesus and Peter. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon answered, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, Take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, Do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey kids, I'm on vacation at the beach and something happened to me on Sunday. I am so excited. I can't wait to tell you about it. I've been coming to this beach for over 45 years and every morning at the sunrise, our whole family gathers out here and then we watch the sunrise and then we walk down to the pier. In 45 years, I've never seen this before, but on Sunday when we came out here, our very first morning at the beach, this beach was just filled with starfish. I couldn't believe it. Like there were thousands of them all the way, this mile long walk all the way to the pier. And it was amazing. And so one of the things that I did was because of that, we started asking questions about starfish and I realized I didn't know a whole lot about them. Did you know that starfish, they're not even fish. They're not fish at all. They're called echinoderms or echinoderms and they're cousins to the sand dollar or the sea urchin. I thought that was pretty cool. One thing that I thought was neat about the starfish is at the end of each arm, there's an eye. I didn't even know starfish had eyes, but their eyes are like at the, at the end of each of those five points. I also learned that when one of those five points breaks off, and sometimes you'll see a starfish with one or two of their legs gone, they can regrow them all by themselves. They call that regeneration. Isn't that something? My son Ben, he was like, do you know how starfish uh, eat? Because he showed us a starfish in the sand and it had like a, a, a clam inside of it. You could see the impression of one of these little clams in the surf. A starfish, there's a hole on the, on the bottom of the starfish and its stomach comes out and eats the clam and then brings it back inside. I thought, that's crazy. Well, as we were walking down the beach, I started feeling sorry for them because the, the tide was starting to go out and I'm thinking these starfish are getting stranded. Some of them you could see moving and we learned that when we turn them over, there's these thousands of, of tiny little tube-like legs and that's what, that's what they move with and that's what they use to pull open the clams and, 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 and get their breakfast, actually. So, we started throwing some of these starfish back into the ocean and that reminded me of this story. I heard this story a long time ago and maybe you've heard it too. There was this little boy on the beach and this old man starts walking down the beach and he sees the little boy down there and the little boy is kind of bending over and waving his arms and the old man was like, what's that little kid doing? Is he down there dancing? Is, is he doing ballet? Is he doing yoga? So the old man comes up to him and and he says, son, what are you doing? And the little boy was like, do, do you see all these starfish on the beach? Like the tide's going out and, and they're gonna be stranded on the beach and they're, they're gonna die in the sun. And he said, so, so I'm, I'm tossing them back into the sea so that they can live. And the old man just kind of shook his head and he's like, son, do you see there's miles and miles of beach? There's hundreds, if not thousands of, of starfish. He's like, you're not going to make a difference. How can you make a difference with all of that? 
the little boy politely listened to him and and then he bent down and he he picked up another starfish and he tossed it into the sea he says well it made a difference with that one and I love that story because you know sometimes especially with us grown-ups everything around us in the world it problems circumstances they seem so big and so enormous and I think how can I make a difference with that like that's just too big for me and I know maybe you feel that way sometimes too but I like the story because it reminds me no matter how big the problem is no matter how small I feel no matter how small you feel there's something we can do and that even the small things it can matter to somebody I can make a difference at least in one person's life and I can do that today and that's pretty exciting and so that's my prayer for us is that God will help us to remember that even though we're small and tiny and everything else seems so big and so impossible we can do something about that so I pray that God will help us and I pray that you guys have an awesome day I'll see you next week You know, when Jesus gets in your boat, things are never the same. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, there's a story about Jesus where uh, he goes down to the Sea of Galilee and he's standing there beside the sea and the crowds are all around him and you know, the crowds are wanting to hear him teach, they're wanting him to, to pray for them, to touch them, to heal them. So a lot of people follow Jesus. Because when Jesus was around, I mean, life just got better. So he notices these two boats right there in the shallows. And he gets into one of the boats. It's, it's the boat that, that belongs to, 
to Simon Peter. Uh, the fishermen that had been in them, uh, they were out of their boats. Uh, they, were, they were washing and, and cleaning up their nets. They had, they had been out there fishing all night. And so Jesus gets into to Peter's boat and he says, put, put out into the shallows. And so Peter puts out into the shallows and uh, Jesus turns around and, and he teaches the crowd that's on the bank. And then after he teaches the crowd, he says to Peter, take your boat and, and go out into the deep water. And so Peter kind of pushes back a little bit. He says, Lord, we've been fishing all night and, and we haven't caught anything. He says, but you know, whatever you say, that's what we'll do it. And so they go out and Jesus says, cast your nets on, on the other side of the boat. And I'm sure Peter's just like, we fished this all night. There's nothing out there. Um, we don't know if he gave Jesus any more pushback on that, uh, but he threw his nets out. He was obedient to what Jesus said. And man, there were so many fish. In fact, there were so many fish in the nets. Uh, they had to c call all of the others uh, in, the, in the other boat. And, and the others came in the other boat and, and uh, helped them bring in the fish. There were so many fish, uh, it, it should have torn the nets. And Luke tells us that they were all just amazed at this, at this catch of fish. You know, I kind of had an experience like that when I was in high school. Uh, my dad was the pastor in Cherokee, and, and so I don't know if it was every day, but it felt like every day I would grab my pole and, and I would go, go back to, to Soco Creek, which was right behind the parsonage. And I, I went out there one day. I mean, it was a beautiful day, just like this. And I fished all up and down Soco Creek. I don't know, a couple hundred yards. I fished every hole. I fished it good too. And I didn't get a single bite. And that happens sometimes. Anyway, I'd been out there for about an hour and I was coming out and when I came out of the creek and uh, I was walking through my dad's garden to get back to the house and Davis Welch started coming with, with his fishing pole. Uh, Davis was my dad's age and uh, they were good friends and he fished back there a lot. In fact, he'd catch a lot of fish and I think just about every Friday in the summertime I have a fish fry back behind the house. And I said, Davis, I've been fishing this all afternoon. I said, there's nothing, there's nothing back there. And I remember he didn't say a word. He just kind of chuckled and nodded his head and he went on back and he fished the streams. It was probably 20 minutes. <laughs> he came back out and he had a stringer full of fish. I was amazed at his catch of fish. And I realized I was in the presence of a, a master fisherman. I realized that he could do things I could never do. And I'm sure that's probably how the disciples felt with Jesus. Uh, not just because of those fish. Uh, just because when Jesus gets in your boat, things change. Uh, things are better. I'll never forget Peter's response. He just kind of falls down in the, in the bottom of the boat and he's just like, Lord, get away from me. Go away from me. I can't be in your presence. He says, for I'm a sinful man. But you know, uh, that didn't stop Jesus. He was like, no. John and, and James, the sons of Zebedee, they, they were there too. He was like, I want you guys to follow me. Because from now on, uh, we're going to fish for people. And they went to the shore. And Luke tells us they got out of the boat. And they left everything. They left their nets. They left everything. And they followed Jesus. And I was thinking about us. Just wondering about your story and your life. I know that when, when Jesus got into my boat, uh, when I first became aware that God was real and that God was alive, you know, kind of like Peter, the, the very first thing that happened to me was this deep awareness of the sin that was in my life, that I wasn't worthy to be in God's presence. And I wept at that. And there was that part of me too, it was just like, um, go away God, I'm too guilty. But Jesus transformed me and I was different. 
and and kind of in the same way it wasn't long after that it wasn't immediate but maybe a couple of weeks I felt God's strong call for my life to to follow and, and to be in ministry and to fish for people I thought today you know, I'm on vacation. I'm at the beach. Uh, time away uh, at, at, the, at the beach, on vacation, on retreat, it's, it's a good time to think about stuff, to think about my life, to think about you guys, to think about uh, our life together in Waynesville. And I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool if, if we just went a little bit in the boat. Maybe you could take this time to um, invite Jesus into your boat <laughs> and just know that that when Jesus gets close, it might not be pretty at first. There might be those things that uh, stir inside of you that, um, that cause a little bit of pain. Uh, you remember you're not worthy. You remember the sin in your life. And just invite Jesus to take that. Invite Jesus to hold on to you. And maybe if you're with your family, y'all could talk about that as a family. Um, how has Jesus been present in... Uh, in your lives together, what are the stories that you can tell? When we do that, life always gets better. So our text today from uh, John chapter 15, it's a part of a larger story. It's the, uh, really the last story that, that John tells in his gospel about, about Jesus' life. And uh, Peter decides to go fishing. <laughs> I mean, he was a fisherman and that's, that's what he knew and that's what he did. And I'm guessing that's also what he loved. Uh, this is um, after the the arrest and, and the crucifixion and death and, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a resurrection story. And I don't know, I've, I've kind of pondered sometimes uh, after all this, were they wondering, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> um, do we just go back to our old way of life? Do we fish? I mean, we gotta provide for our families and stuff, you know. Anyway, it's kind of the same story. They're fishing all night, hadn't caught anything. And then, and then Jesus shows up. You know, Jesus always seems to, to find us when we need to be found. And so Jesus is, is standing on uh, the shore of the sea. And he, he hollers out to them and, and says, Hey, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And again, I wonder what they were thinking about that. Like, who's this guy? They didn't recognize him. Who's this guy telling us how to, how to do our fishing? And... So they do. They throw their nets on the other side of the boat and there's this amazing haul of fish again, just like in the other story. And Peter recognizes Jesus. And I think that's an important thing for us, you know, that we recognize when God is present, that we, we recognize um, when Jesus is in the boat. And so he, 
he puts his clothes back on and he, he jumps in the water and he leaves all the others with, with the task of, of hauling in all the fish. And, and um, Peter would do things like that, just kind of rash, spur of the moment. And he swims to where Jesus is. This is a, a powerful story for me. I, I love that Jesus already had some fish. Uh, he has a, a charcoal fire burning on the beach. And then when, when the disciples get uh, to the beach and they, they haul all the fish in, uh, Jesus said, bring some of your fish and let's have breakfast. They had breakfast by the sea. And after they have breakfast together, there's this, this intimate conversation. Uh, our text that, uh, that my dad read for us a little while ago. Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? By this charcoal fire. And Peter's like, of course. And then a second time. And then a third time. And I think Peter might have been sad or, or frustrated. Um, because he's like, of, co- of course I love you. Why, why are you doubting my love for you? Well, why wouldn't Jesus doubt his, his love for him? I mean, earlier in the narrative... Peter had pledged his life. He's like, I I will lay down my life for you, Jesus. I will follow you anywhere. I will die for you kind of commitment. And then when Jesus is arrested, Peter and all the others, they completely run away. They they all deserted him and fled, and Jesus was left alone. And then around a charcoal fire, it's around a charcoal fire where Peter denies Jesus three times. He has three opportunities to... uh, to, to stand up for Jesus, to, to claim his faith in Jesus, and he doesn't. And so that was a huge disappointment, not only for Jesus, but obviously for Peter. Uh, he, he went out after that and just wept deeply. There was just some deep hurt there. And I don't know if Jesus asking these questions kind of stirred that up. It was a painful memory. And I'm thinking, of course Jesus stirred that up on purpose. And I think that's one of the things that happens when, when Jesus comes close. Uh, is it stirs up things that need to be stirred up. And I don't know, I just think it'd be good for us to do that, um, to allow ourselves to go to those places that we avoid, to remember the painful times, um, and allow Jesus to take those from us. Uh, in, in a sense, Jesus uh, gives Peter an opportunity to proclaim his love um, and, to, and to receive forgiveness. And so I don't know if they were sitting by this fire or if Peter and Jesus were, were strolling down the beach, kind of like our, our family does when we stroll to the pier. But they have this very intimate conversation, and the conversation goes deep. And I think there was some deep healing. And then it doesn't end there. God always has some purpose for our lives. And so again, he calls Peter, this fisherman, kind of into a shepherd's role. I want you to take care of my sheep. I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to lead my church. And again, it's just very clear that it's people that matter and that God calls us to people, to each other, uh, to care for each other, um, to care for the people of our world. So my prayer for us is that God will stir those things in us that need to be stirred. It's probably a lot of that these days. And that in that we'll find some deep healing. And in that we'll have a sense of what is it that God's calling us to do? Who are the people uh, that God is calling us to? And that we'll go. Y'all have a good day. Holy God, we reach out to you with outstretched arms. We want from the depths of our heart to know that we love you. We want to, from the very depths of our souls, to cry out that, yes, Lord, we are the ones that will feed your sheep. We desperately want to be the ones that are dedicated followers of you, 
seeking to prove our love for you. While we also recognize that there is nothing to prove, because you know the very depths of our souls before we even say the words. So God, help us to be your people. Form within our souls a longing to follow you and to love your people as you love them. No matter how difficult that might be for us, and no matter how counterintuitive it might be in our brains, we surrender to you all that we are and all that we have every bit of our soul. So we ask that you receive our offering today and continue to keep our hearts open. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
One time Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea, and the net caught fish of every kind. What Jesus means is that God's net catches people of every kind. People like you and people like me. When this happens, we know we're loved, we know we're forgiven, and we know we're needed. These fishing stories from the Bible remind us that when God gets hold of us, our deepest hurts are healed and life takes on new meaning and purpose. So as we go today, I pray that we go with the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and go in peace. Amen.